So we've been talking so far mostly about the way idealism conceives of the mind. We're now going to shift our focus to the way that idealism conceives of history, specifically the way that one German idealist philosopher conceives of history, and that philosopher is George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. So just to set some parameters for talking about Hegel, we're talking about Hegel within a specific context. We're going to be looking at one particular aspect of Hegel's philosophy, which is his philosophy of history. We're going to be looking at that because it is that kind of conception of history uh, to which Marx is responding with his eventual development of a materialist conception of history. This is, of course, not meant to be uh, an exhaustive or very in-depth summary or review of Hegel's philosophy of history, or certainly not of his, Hegel's philosophy overall. Uh, the aim here in, is, is to gain clarity on exactly what kinds of other philosophical schools of thought was Marx wrestling with, dialoguing with, debating with, as he develops his own conception of history, his historical materialism. So what is Hegel's understanding of history? It's very... <laughs> It's, uh, it's very hard to preface it with anything um, because on the one hand, there's really nothing else quite like it. And you could say that about pretty much all of Hegel's philosophy. Hegel's philosophy was unprecedented in its uh, unbelievable scope. Uh, basically, Hegel wanted his philosophy to encompass everything, science, culture, religion, history, on the other hand, the conception of history that we're going to end up flushing out here may actually sound somewhat familiar. We may as well just dive into it. So, Hegel's understanding of history is that history itself is a process. This is a teleological conception of history, is another word we could ascribe to it. Teleological means that it is something that has some kind of purpose, or if we don't like that, if we think that's, that language is too strong, we can say that it's something that uh, has some sort of end, some sort of aim in mind. So it's a, a, a process, and it's a rational process. It's a logical process. It proceeds according to some kind of logic. It begins at a logical starting point, some point of singularity, and it proceeds to, again, a logical end point. It returns to that singularity. Between those, between the beginning and the end, you have conflicts, conflicts between ideas. What kind of ideas are we talking about? The idea that uh, my black marker ran out of ink, so I should probably go get some more black markers. Um, no, that's Hegel doesn't care about me and my markers. When Hegel talks about conflicts between ideas, think big ideas, ideas like philosophies, you know, philosophical schools, religions, societies, systems of government, uh, ideals, values of a of a culture of a nation. Um, these are the big ideas that Hegel is thinking about. And these ideas clash with each other. And over time, these ideas uh, resolve into unity, into oneness. And that happens in two ways. It happens uh, on small scale. Well, maybe not so small scale, but it happens with individual clashes between, you know, a pair of ideas, um, a dialectic and there will emerge a synthesis of these two opposing ideas. On the other hand, ultimately, what history is, is driving towards is a point at which all ideas will resolve into total unity with what Hegel calls an absolute idea. It is a one single unifying idea of which all these other ideas are instantiations, manifestations, or expressions. This quote is from Hegel's Philosophy of Right, where he writes that 
History is the idea, notice the capital I. History is the idea of clothing itself in the form of events. So all the events of history, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, uh, Mesopotamia, the invention of writing, you know, the discovery of fire, uh, Charles Darwin, um, the Protestant Reformation, uh, the Crusades, and any, all of these big major shifts in culture and religion and society and, and thought, mass thought of large groups of people. All of that is certainly happening. Just like Kant, Hegel does not deny the external world. But it's not us doing it. It is something that Hegel calls Geist, which has been translated as spirit. It has also been translated as mind. If I'm not mistaken, the translation of Geist as mind uh, came first, and it's only after that tr translators started using spirit. Other translators use spirit slash mind or mind slash spirit. Um, let's see. I have mind slash spirit because um, I like both. What, what this implies is that all of history, including all the activities that we do, all the activities that Marx thinks is so important, sure, they're all happening, but they are ultimately not our activities. They are rather this geist, this mind spirit expressing itself through us. So we're basically like a role that is being played out by spirit, by geist, by mind, for, for the purposes of its own self-realization. And this is going to go on until eventually spirit will just, everything will just merge back into the one. And if this sounds very mystical, well, that's kind of because it is. It is very mystical. Um, a lot of people see a lot of similarities between Hegel and uh, Hinduism, or at least some strands of Hinduism, particularly like the uh, the Upanishads, I guess, would be, would be the best to look at in terms of looking for something close to Hegel. And um, obviously, all this kind of stuff is, we, we've, we've mentioned a few times that Marx doesn't really dig abstractions. It doesn't get much more abstract than this. Now, Hegel's philosophy is um, very, it is very attractive to Marx, like very attractive to a lot of philosophers. Hegel's philosophy is the sort that it's, it's not exactly relevant if you agree with him or not. His philosophy is just so big and so all-encompassing that um, agreeing with it, disagreeing with it, isn't really on the menu. It's what are you going to do with it? Uh, what are you going to take from it? And what are you going to leave behind? Marx wants to take uh, the process, the historical process, the idea that history follows some kind of, uh, that there's some kind of logic to the way things happen in history, particularly with big social changes. Uh, Marx likes that. What he doesn't like is that Hegel doesn't give credit where Marx thinks credit is due. He doesn't ascribe the active side to human beings. He ascribes it to, to Geist, to the spirit of the world, to spirit of history, realizing itself, playing out its parts in the form of major historical events. If all of history, including the activity of us human beings, is really just this geist realizing itself, if all of the ideas, the big ideas of human history are just expressions of some one single absolute idea uh, towards which history is purportedly proceeding, then we can certainly say that human activity, real sensuous activity, as Marx calls it, is not the active side in Hegel's philosophy. 
the active side is, of course, the activity of Geist. And if that's the case, then you have two problems. If you're Karl Marx and you want to do philosophy that's revolutionary, that can change the world, you got two problems with, with Hegel's idealist conception of history. First is that whatever conditions are present in a society at any given point in history, that just is the expression of Geist at that moment. That can be kind of a problem if the conditions in a society are really bad, like the people are starving because the king is incompetent. And if that's the case, you're gonna have a hard time motivating people, getting people to recognize that there is a problem and most importantly, that there's something that they can do about it, which is the second problem. This kind of conception of history takes the power away from people and puts it in the hands of something that, for Marx, is non-existent. Um, at, at best, it is something that is abstract from the material world. Whichever way you want to slice it, it's the same result. It's taking the power out of the hands of people and placing it in something else. And the result of that is basically, if you want things to change, you have to wait. You have to wait for Geist to express itself in such a way that is more appealing, more beneficial to you. Ultimately, we know Marx is criti going to criticize capitalism. So if you accept this idealist conception of history and you look at a capitalist society, you're going to think, well, this is the way Geist is expressing itself. This is the idea that has won out over time. So we don't need to change it. And if you're Karl Marx, that's, that's, um, that's not going to work.